Well, good morning, church. It is, a, it is a true honor and a true privilege to be here standing up before you word, okay? When Mike gets up here day after day, week after week, Wednesday after Wednesday, preaching the word, telling us what we need to hear, letting the spirit of God work through him, it's humbling. But, but I respect it, you know? I have great respect for, for Dr. Chin, uh, you know, who was up here last week sharing and, and, and just laying it out so we could understand what God needed us to see. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy to be up here. I'm nervous. Um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, no, we're good. Okay. Oh, hey, I got one thing to do before we start. Uh, this, isn't my, this isn't what I do all the time. So today's the last day I have to do it. So today is the day I get to do what I darn well please. Tighten it up. Let's tighten it up. I need you guys to tighten it up. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Act like you love one another. Let's tighten it up. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. I can. I got to do this quickly. I got to do it quickly. They won't let me. <laughs> Amen. One, two, three. Yay! All right. All right. You guys, you guys are awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that very much, you guys. <laughs> you all right with that, Mike? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Mike, I, I just thank you for letting me have this opportunity today. Um, like I said, it's an honor to be here. And uh, uh, I don't take this, this day lightly and what I need to do. But, you know, like I said, Mike and Ken, they've done amazing jobs in leading us and understanding the churches in, in Revelation, the letters that were written to the churches in Revelation, the seven churches. Uh, you know, we learned a lot from so far from those guys. Uh, what did we learn? We learned uh, the church of Ephesus. Uh, they lost their first love. We learned about the church in Smyrna. They became cowards. They couldn't stand up to the persecution. We learned about the church in Pergamum. Listening to all that was going on around them, all the false teachings. We learned about the church in Thyatira tolerating sin in the church. But today we find out about the church in Philadelphia. The church that God lifted up and, 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 and just said, hey, these guys are great. These guys are doing it right. I commend them for what they did. I am grateful for their example that they set in the midst of such great trial and tribulation. They stood firm. And, you know, we got to ask ourselves, how did that church get there? How did they get to that point to be raised up for that kind of an example? And I guess the greater, the greater question is for us, what kind of recognition would God consider the DMV ICC worthy of? The title of my lesson today is Patient Endurance. You know, if God sent a message to the DMV ICC, what would he say? You know, these letters sent warnings to those churches. But not only did they send warnings, they sent encouragement. Because you get to see both sides of the coin here. If you, if you do what he says, this will happen. If you don't do what he says, this is what will happen. And so there's encouragement, but there's warnings. And the call was to look at what the church is like that goes against God's word and the one that obeys it. The question is, what type of church do we want DMV ICC to be recognized as? An example worthy of imitation for doing the good that they ought to do, or one that is an example of what not to do and the consequences of those actions. You know, there's a little history to the church in Philadelphia. Um, they were this church in the, in the area of uh, uh, Asia Minor, which is now modern day Turkey. Uh, they were situated on a road uh, that was leading in from the coast of Turkey and the ocean there that led through a various number of churches, including the two, we've already, two of the ones we've already heard from. And uh, this was like a main thoroughfare, a major highway. It's like 95 going all the way to Florida. But it was their road that, 
the Roman soldiers used. It was used by the mail services that were going on in those days. It was used by everybody. So a lot of stuff was going in and out of the church in Philadelphia, in and out of the city of Philadelphia. But because of that, there was so much going on. There were so many ideas being brought into the city. There were, there were so many teachings being brought into the city. There was so much sin being brought into that city. And yet here was this church, this little church that stood out. You know, I think about, uh, I don't know if many of you saw the movie Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he had this little house, right? And in the midst of all this big construction going on, here was this little house that stood firm, that didn't give in to what was going on around it. That's the church of Philadelphia. That needs to be the church of the DMV. Amen. The city was a border town that they were in. It was near Lydda, Mysia, Phrygia. I said them all incorrectly, but that's okay. And it was founded for the purpose, though, of expanding the Greek language. Um, they spoke Greek, but this church, the city was planted so that the language and, and all of the culture of the Greeks could expand out. And, and we all know that wasn't just by happenstance. That was God working. That was God setting up this church for victory. His word was going to come out of this church. And it was going to be able to be preached because everybody knew the language. It wasn't like they had to go to a city that spoke a different language and try to, try to preach to them. No, they knew the language and they could preach the word of God to them. That's God working. He's working in our lives just like that. He's got plans going on for each and every one of our lives. But you're, like I said before, there's all kinds of pagan stuff going on. Uh, the, the Jews had a very strong presence in this city. And so you got the pagans, you got just the flat out sinners, you got the, the Jews, you got, you got these, the Roman centurions and soldiers, you got all this stuff that was being bombarded on, upon the church there. And it was founded in 189 BC, and it was named by a gentleman by the name of Eumenes II, the second. And look that one up, amen, for the pronunciation. <laughs> And it was, it was named for the love that his brother had for him. His brother's name was um, um, Atellus too. Yeah, I hope I, hope I did that one justice. But it was the loyalty that this young, his young brother had for his older brother that got him the name of Philadelphus. And the literal meaning was one who loves his brother. Thus the name brotherly love. So let's open up our Bibles and get into it. Amen. Revelation three in verse seven, it says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut and what he shuts. No one can open. Let's stop right here and, and recognize what's being said here. Jesus is setting up his, his role, his authority. As he has done in all the letters to all the other churches, he starts off by saying, hey, this is who I am. I am God. He calls himself the Holy One, set apart above all else. He is God to this church, emphasizing his authority. He goes on, he says, I, he is true. I am true. He calls himself the truth. Why? Well, with all that I said was going on around this city, there was a lot of untruth. There was a lot of mixed messages. There was a lot of confusion, deception, deceit, all that was going on around them. He needed to emphasize the fact here am I the truth. Hold on to me. And he says, like it says in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth. We need to hear that. We need to hold on to that. But then he goes on and says, who holds the key of David. Now, I don't know if everybody knows what that's a reference to, but uh, it was a, a, a fulfillment of a promise and a covenant that God made with David back in the Old Testament. And if you look at uh, 2 Samuel 7, you'll see where this happens. 2 Samuel 7, verse 11. Like I said, this was the fulfillment that, that the covenant that God had made with David. And it says in verse 11, 
The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Your own flesh and blood, I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. As I took it away from Saul when I removed from, who removed him from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Jesus is again affirming who he is. I am the one. I am the fulfillment of that scripture. And this is what they needed to know. This is what they needed to hear. But why, why, why is this church though so important? What, what was so big about that church? Many churches probably suffered and held on and did, the, did what they needed to do in, in, in adverse situations. But why are these guys so important? Let's keep reading. Let's go back over to Revelation 3 and we're going to look in verse 8. He says, I know your deeds. He said that to many of the churches that he wrote to. He says, I know your deeds. Uh, let, let's stop for a minute. Let me, let me tell you guys something. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. I don't know about you, but when I hear that said, I kind of, you know, the chill bumps come up. You know, there's, there's a little tingle down the back. It's like, you know my deeds? You, uh, uh oh. Hold up. He knows what I do. He knows why I do it. He knows why I think of doing it. He knows what is in my heart to think about why I do it and then pulling it off and doing it. He knows there's no, there's no hiding from him. He knows what we do. He knows what we do when no one else is watching. He knows what we do when our motives are impure and wrong, what we think, what we feel. And you know what? He's going to either commend us for those deeds or he's going to condemn us for those deeds. I want to be one who is commended for my deeds. How about you? You want to be commended for your deeds? But you got to ask yourself, what does God see in me? You got to be real. We got to be honest with ourselves. What does God see in me? Psalm 139 verse one, flip over there if you can real quick. I got a lot of scriptures today, so bear with me. Amen. Oh, amen. He's got them up here. This is kind of cool. I like this. He says, Psalm 139 and verse one, it says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You know, we can't fool God. You know, we can fool each other. And uh, we, can, we can, you know, keep some things hidden from one another. But it ain't happening with God. He's well aware of who you are, what you are, and why you do it. I, I have to look at my life, and I have to be honest. If, if he wrote this to the church of the DMV, what would he say about our deeds? Would we be commended or would we be condemned? Jesus says, I have placed before you in back in our scripture. He says, I've placed before you an open door that cannot be shut. God was setting them up for victory. He was setting them up to do his will. He had opened up the door that his word could go out from that church and it couldn't be shut. Nothing would shut or stop the church from preaching the word powerfully. Their language had spread so that God's message could be sent out through all the areas around them. Like seeds carried by the wind, his word was going to go out from this church. Amen. Like seeds carried by the wind, the word needs to go out from the DMV ICC. Amen. We continue though in verse eight. I'm going to read in the second half of verse eight. It says, I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This little church 
was being attacked and persecuted from all sides because of this. And because of this, they had grown weak and they had little strength. They were suffering. Is anyone here suffering today? Is anyone here having little strength right now? Feeling weak? We got, we got things that are coming after us, you guys. Come on. Let's be honest. It's, it's taken its toll on us. And, and, and it took its toll on this church. They were suffering. yet, But he says, but it, yet they remained faithful in the face of all these trials. That's what the call is for us. We got to remain faithful. We can't let go. They were reminded that you got to stay faithful in the, in the face of trials. And just like this church, we're being attacked. It's coming from all sides. It's in many ways. And just like the church in Philadelphia, we're going to be weak. But they showed great fortitude. They showed great strength during their suffering. And that's because they knew who they were suffering for. Jesus had made it clear who he was. That he was their Lord and they were suffering for him. Not for men, but for him. And because they understood who they were suffering for, they were able to keep God's word and they were able to keep their eyes on the prize. I, I appreciate my, my wife's communion. Um, yeah. She's an awesome, awesome wife. Uh, just to have her as, as my help, as my support, as my encouragement, um, you know, I wouldn't be here. And I'm just grateful that God put you in my life. But you talked about fixing your eyes. We have to fix our eyes on what matters most so that we don't take our eyes off of it and, and focus on what doesn't matter. Are you suffering today? Who are you suffering for? If in fact you are actually suffering. First Peter 4.12. First Peter 4.12. It says, dear friends, <clears throat> do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. As though something strange, <clears throat> excuse me, were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you Bear his name. For it is, it's, it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? <coughs> Excuse me. We all know that suffering is a part of being a Christian, right? It's what we are, we, we, we did, we are going after. Suffering is, is an indication of who we are. If there's no suffering, you got to ask yourself, what am I doing? But... We got to suffer for the right reasons, it says here. We, got, we can't suffer as a murderer, amen. Any murderers in the room? We can't suffer as a criminal. Any criminals in the room? Well, amen, I got to raise my hand on that one. I was, a, I was a criminal. But then it says I can't suffer as a meddler. Where in the world did that come from? I just didn't get that one, you know. Um, I'm like, how did that fit into the scheme of things here? I'm a murderer or I'm a meddler? But obviously to God, they are the same. So I had to look up what is a meddler. A meddler is a person, by definition, it says, a person who tries to change or have influence on things that are not his or her responsibility. So why... So... So why, does it, why is that important to God? Why does he not want you to be that guy? You know, as a true Christian, we'll, we'll either suffer for Christ or we will settle for a softer way of living. What's it going to be for you today? Are you suffering 
from the fight against the true enemy? Not, or are you suffering from fighting each other? This is, this is God's house. This, you are God's family. If you're a true disciple today, you're God's family. The fight is not against one another. The fight is against the evil one. That's who our fight is against. You know what? We must each suffer for the right reason. And that's for the glory of God. Amen. My second point, persevering for the truth. My first point was suffering for the truth. My second point, persevering for the truth. So how did this church make it? They persevered, right? You know, when they suffered, it was their reliance on Jesus in the midst of that suffering that gave them strength. They held on to his word. That's what got them through it. They persevered. You know, your perseverance is shown by what you do in tough times. Yeah. You know, when, when, when it's darkest, how do you hold up under that? How do, you, how do you keep going? Perseverance is the ability to keep going regardless of what is the obstacle. And then in verse two, or in verse uh, two here, the second part of it, he says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. They, they kept his word. They were obedient in their perseverance. The standard for their lives was simply do what it says. There wasn't a lot of him and hawing probably. They just simply looked at the word of God and said, okay, I got to do that. I'm going to hold to that. I'm going I'm to I'm get my strength from that. You know, when I have a little strength, I'm, I'm never going to conquer the persecution on my own. Uh, my, my own determination won't be enough. My iron will won't be enough. I've got to rely on God. We've all got to rely, rely on God. You know, when I realize Jesus and his word is all I have when times are tough, I realize that Jesus and his word is all I need. There's nothing else that's going to sustain me. There's nothing else that's going to help me overcome the tough stuff. So I got to hold on to it. You see, their faith and hope in Jesus allowed them to rise above their own strengths and to grab onto God's strength. Does your faith and hope in Jesus and in God's word give you the ability to rise above what you didn't even think you could rise above? Does it give you strength beyond your imagination because you're going to hold on to God's strength? Is that what your faith and hope do for you? That's what it should do for you today, guys. You know, we can, go re we can grow weak from doing what is right. I grow weak all the time. And, and when we do, we can start to compromise our convictions. When we grow weak, we can begin to doubt. And we can be begin to question the things that we once held as truth. Hebrews 12, 3. It says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him who endured such opposition. What was the opposition that he endured? The cross, the persecution, the flogging, the beating. We got to consider that so that we don't grow weary and lose heart. When we grow weary, we lose heart and, when, and, and we give in to cowardice. We start to step back from things. We start to, we start to go, okay, they got it. I'm a, I'm a, I got to take care of business over here. And we forget. No, 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 no. God has given us his spirit. He's given us his word. He's given us Jesus as an example so that we do not lose heart and grow weary, but we persevere. The church in Philadelphia had grown weak, but they did not lose heart because they stayed close to their God and to his word. Today, I challenge you guys, if you're, if you're not there, get there. Draw nearer to God. Draw nearer to his word. Make a decision today that, you know what? I am no longer going to be on the fringe. I am no longer going to be weak. I'm going to get strong because of God's word and my relationship with him. Amen? But now, here's something you got to look at. Look at Philippians 4.4. 4. I told you I got a few scriptures here. Um, Philippians 4.4, 4, in the midst of that, that suffering and that, 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 that perseverance, it says here in Philippians 4.4, 4, we've read it often, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Wow, in the midst of our trials and, and challenges, we need to be rejoicing, not downtrodden. 
But he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Uh Uh-oh. Let your gentleness be evident, not your attitude. He says, the Lord is near. Uh Uh-oh. I know your deeds. Why? Because I'm near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Don't sit there with an attitude. Go to God. Go, draw nearer to God. Go take care of things. And it says, and the peace of God, amen, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. <laughs> you got you to gotta realize when our hearts and, and minds are not guarded, they go all, all, all over the place. They are easily influenced by so much. We got to keep our mind and heart on the prize. Finally, in verse eight, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So did he say in here to think about the, 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 the go, all the goings on and all the discussions and all the, the worries and fears and uh, the bills and all that? Is that what he told you to think about and to focus on? No. He said, think about these things. Paul's talking about what we need to do when the tough times come. You know, when the tough times come, we, we can do one of two things. We can go to God. Or we can go to ourselves and to the people that we think can help us. No, we got to go to God and let him guide us to where we need to go. Amen. He says, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know, when I'm facing tough times, um, you know, I, I, I try to get tough. I'm a man up. I can do this. I, don't, I, I got this. I don't even think about God. I got this, God. You ever do that? Be honest. You know, sometimes all I can do is turn on law and order. Uh, or, uh, or one of my other favorite shows, Psych. And veg out. Yeah, psych, psych, psyches, you know, we're, we're special people. And just veg out when tough times hit. And when we grow weak from the battles, you got to set your hearts and minds on the right things, guys. For the DMV ICC to make it through these tough times, we need to get close to God. We need to stay there. We can't wa- waver. We can't, we can't stray we got to stay there with God. Amen. You know, Mike preached last uh, Wednesday before last uh, lesson, and uh, he, he, he shared the scripture in Luke 8 about the, the um, bleeding woman. And uh, you remember that? Amen. Um, but, but what he preached about was the desperation and her desperation to be healed. And this woman, I had to think about it. She bled for 12 years. I don't know about you guys. I bleed for five minutes and, and I'm, I'm a mess. I'm, I'm, I'm distraught. I'm hurting. I'm, I'm like, well, Vicky. But this woman bled for 12 years. Um, talk about weak. I can only imagine how weak this woman was, but she was desperate. I, can, I, I pictured her literally crawling to try and touch Jesus. Her desperation was real. Is your desperation real today to be healed? We need to be healed. This church needs to be healed. But when our hearts and minds are set on the wrong things, not only are we not getting healing, we're being harmed. It dis, uh, our hearts and minds are deceitful, guys. And if we're not close to God and our minds and hearts are not set on the right things, we're harming ourselves even more. And when our hearts and minds are set on the wrong thing, we forget that God has a plan for us. And, and we start coming up with our own plans. I do. I, 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 I toughen up. I think I'm going to figure it out. I got a plan. But it's my plan. It's not the plan that I've sought out advice on. It's not the plan that I've gone to God in prayer on. It's my plan. The, the Bible in Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God's got a plan for us. What does it say about his plan? It says it will not harm us. 
So I got to get close to God. I got to stay close to God so that I can tap into his plan and not be harmed any longer, but rather be healed. Amen. Amen. Well, let's keep reading. Verse nine. It says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Wow. Here the letter is talking to the, about the people that are persecuting the church. That synagogue of Satan. I'm like, dang, that's a hard term. Um, these are the Jews. This is the synagogue he was talking about. But, he, you know, it's not that they, they were real Jews. He's saying, no, these are not real Jews. These are the ones that are in the synagogue of Satan. Um, I'm thinking to myself, how, how bad must that synagogue be? You know, to be given that title, Jesus makes it clear that those Jews who had ascend, descended from Abraham yet rejected Jesus were not real Jews. But he says, you know what? I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to deal with them on behalf of the church. You don't have to worry about it. I got this. The persecutors of us, of this church, we don't have to worry about it. God's got this. He's going to deal with them. All we need to do is focus on him. Jesus reveals the real enemy. Those who, who follow Satan. Those who are deceivers. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's all around us. And we have to be able to stay close to God so, so we can see that truth. You know, it, it's great to know that he's going to take up our battle. It's great to know that we can take heart in knowing that God's going to deal with those who persecute us. And that those are who are not true Christians are going to have to deal with God. We need not worry. We need not fret. Psalm 37, one. Psalm 37, one, it says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be anxious of those who do wrong for like the grass, they will soon wither like the green plants. They will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he'll do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways. When they carry out their wicked schemes, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. What an amazing scripture. What, what, a, what, a, what an amazing passage to, of hope. All we got to do is be still. All we got to do is stay close to God. You don't have to, we don't have to bother ourselves with what they do. You and I don't need to join in useless arguments. God's going to make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Amen? Amen. We need only focus on what matters. And that is helping as many as possible come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. Amen? Amen. That's what we're here to do. You know, it says we only need to wait patiently. Or in other words, as it says in verse 10, endure patiently. As you know, the title of my lesson was Patient Endurance. You know, and because, yeah, I know. And because of obedience to his command to endure patiently, because of their obedience to that command, he says, I will take care of you in the time of judgment. Wow. When the time comes, when we are judged, because of our obedience to the command to have patience, patient endurance, he says, I got you. I'm going to take care of you when that time comes. Isn't that encouraging? Doesn't that, doesn't that fire you up to know God? God's doing everything to get you there, people. Just, just stay close to me, he says. Just, just focus on me. It's time to get back to fighting for souls with all of your hearts. 
Not bits and pieces because of all that's distracting you, but shaking off all that's hindering and all that's entangling and get back to the work of the Lord. Amen. My final point, holding on to the truth. We suffered for the truth. We persevered for the truth. Now we have to hold on to the truth. Amen. Let's close out in verse 11 of the of Revelations 3. It says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. You know, Jesus tells the church to hold on. Just hold on. I'm coming. I got you. Just hold on. Earlier, he said, they kept his commands with patient endurance, not being anxious or worried, but patient. Knowing Jesus was coming and until he came, God was going to take care of him and protect him. He didn't have to worry. They didn't have to get anxious. Hold on to what you have. What do you have? You ever thought about it? He says, hold on to what you have. Don't let everybody take your crown. But what do you have? Do you have the love of Jesus? Do you have the power of his Holy Spirit? Do you have the hope of salvation that your name is written in the book of life and that one day you're going to be in heaven with him? Do you have that? Then you got to hold on to that, you guys. Let, let, don't, don't, don't hold on to what doesn't matter. Sorry if I kind of threw my glasses down. I, <laughs> Galatians chapter one and verse six. Let's, switch, let's flip over there. We know that, you know, that crown represents the crown of our salvation. He, he talked about that to the church in uh, Thyatira as well in chapter 2, verse 25. Don't let anybody take that crown. But in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, Ooh, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Does that sound like somebody that's holding on? Which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. I am now trying to win the approval. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I'm still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It, guys, the world is trying to fill our arms with all kinds of stuff. And they want to fill our arms with anything and everything else so that we take our hold and release it from Jesus. We got to hold on to what we know. We got to hold on to what we have. Don't let the world cause you to let your grip go. Second Thessalonians 3.11, you don't have to turn there. It says, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Let's stop being busy bodies, gang. Let's get to work. Let's get to work doing the will of God. Amen. You know, you guys are running a good race. Get back in your lane so that you can finish the race. It says, hold on to what you have, your love for God, his son, his people, his word. Hold on to these things, you guys. You know what happens when we don't hold to him? We lose our crown. We can lose our salvation. You know, we're swimming upstream against a current of sin and deception, worldliness and doubt. And if we don't swim against this, we will be carried away by it. We cannot alter the truth, you guys. We cannot minimize the truth. We cannot compromise the truth. The truth is the truth. And we must hold on to it so that we can be the light that shines in this great darkness. To the church of the DMV ICC right. I know your deeds. You suffer for the truth. You persevere for the truth. You hold to the truth. And to God be the glory. I love you guys.